We are picking up now from the Reformation and moving forward. And so we're going to spend today and probably a little bit of our class time on Thursday talking about the Puritan movement. And uh, then we'll also talk a little bit about what was happening elsewhere in Europe after the Reformation. We'll look at what was happening in Germany with uh, sort of the setting in of dead orthodoxy and then the rise of a movement uh, known as, well, eventually it produces the Moravian movement, but known as the Pietist movement. That will become very significant. Uh, Also in France, really the French Protestants are known as the Huguenots or Huguenots. And uh, they have a really violent conflict with the French Catholics. We'll talk about that just a little bit. In the Netherlands, the Netherlands really becomes a Calvinistic country. Uh, We'll have the rise of Arminianism as a reaction to Dutch Calvinism. There will be a synod in the early 1600s called the Synod of Dort that will respond to all of that. And so we'll cover some of those movements briefly as we kind of move forward from the Reformation into later generations and centuries of church history. But for our purposes, our main focus in this class is going to be on the history of English Christianity now. It'll be English Christianity in England first, and then it'll be English Christianity as it comes across the Atlantic and begins to establish itself in New England, which is called New England because it was intending to be just like Old England, except in a different part of the world on the new, newly discovered continent of America. And then, of course, we'll have the birth of the United States, and then we'll have really what we talk about when we speak of U.S. church history, and uh, the term America has almost become a a synonym for the United States, and so we'll speak of American church history as we look at the history of Christianity within the United States, leading up to uh, really an understanding of modern American evangelicalism and uh, where we are at today. An important link in that chain from the Reformation to American church history is the development of the Puritan movement. We already introduced the Puritans just briefly last week, but when we speak of the Puritans, and we know the word Puritan, and we talk about the Puritans a lot, and we talk about Puritan theology and Puritan literature, and people will read Puritan devotionals, and they'll talk about who their favorite Puritans are, but who are these people? Um, really, in a nutshell, the Puritans are the children of the Reformation in England who wanted to see the Reformation fully take root in the Anglican Church and never were fully successful in that endeavor. And the the history of Puritanism in England is a history of really a struggle against the more mainline Anglicans, the traditionalists, who wanted to retain some of that high church liturgy, which the Puritans always felt was still too much of a throwback to Roman Catholicism, something they wanted to see purified out of the church. Because there are so many Puritans, and because we know many of them well, um, we're going to only look at a few of them, but you can see even from this slide up here that I've just pictured, I don't know, I guess I have 10 Puritan portraits there, and that would only be a small sampling of the hundreds of Christian leaders in England, conservative Christian leaders, who, we will, um, who make up and constitute this Puritan movement. In some ways, the Puritan movement is almost like the conservative evangelical movement of the late 16th century, the 17th century, even into the early 18th century, though Puritanism really declines by the end of the 1600s, and then it is reborn almost in the evangelical revival of the 1700s. So let's talk a little bit about the Puritans. I've got a timeline here to kind of provide a framework for our discussion. If it starts with the Reformation and the 95 Theses of Martin Luther and then 1519 Zwingli coming to Zurich and we have Calvin coming to Geneva in 1536 and just two years before that, the Act of Supremacy of 1534 where Henry VIII is declared the supreme head of the Church of England. We have in just these four points on our timeline, the birth of Lutheranism, the birth of the Reformed Movement, uh, the 
Christianization of that Reformed theology under Calvin and his institutes, and then, of course, the birth of Anglicanism, the major denominations, if we can call them that, of the Protestant movement now out of the Reformation. And as we move forward, we'll start to see that how these things affect English church history in particular. 1547, we have Eng uh, Edward, the boy king, becoming the king of England. 1553, his half-sister Mary and many of those English Protestants flee. 300 English Protestant leaders are put to death uh, because they are captured in England, but many others flee. They are then further influenced by people like John Calvin in Geneva, by Martin Bootser in Strasbourg, and other Protestant cities of refuge in mainland Europe. They become fully convinced of the Reformed approach to theology and to ecclesiology. And so after Mary dies and Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558, you have all of these English refugees returning and they come with Reformed conviction. And so they want to see really the church in England fully Reformed. That's never going to happen for them the way that they would hope that it will. Because even under Elizabeth, we have sort of this middle way, uh, this, I suppose we could call it a via media, this middle way of Anglicanism, where we're going to have an Episcopal form of church government, Episcopalian form of church government, Episcopal coming from the word bishop, and uh, what we mean by that is we're going to have a system of bishops and archbishops kind of replacing the cardinal system of the Roman Catholic Church. And instead of a pope, we are now going to have a king or a queen who is going to be the head of the Church of England. Then along with that, we're going to have sort of a traditionalist high church liturgy, one that seems to some to still be a throwback to Catholicism. It's going to be directed by the Book of Common Prayer. And that book is going to, it's going to provide a very specific paradigm for how church is to be done in an Anglican church week after week, Sunday after Sunday. What portions of scripture are read, what hymns are sung, what prayers are said in public. Uh, the, and then it will have a Reformed theology, or a Reformed soteriology in particular. So when the Anglican Church begins, it is Calvinistic in its theology, it is High Church in its liturgy, and it is Episcopalian in its church government. And so for the Puritans, they like the Reformed soteriology, they don't like the high church liturgy. They feel it's too Catholic. And they certainly don't like the fact that there would be a king or a queen declaring themselves to be the supreme head or the supreme governor, in the case of Elizabeth, of the Church of England. And so the Puritans begin to uh, react against certain elements in the Anglican system which they want to see purified. Uh, they don't actually give themselves the name Puritan. It is their... Uh, more moderate or traditionalist Anglican opponents who give them the name Puritan. Uh, but these are people who want to see the Church of England purified, and eventually they take that name on for themselves. And so this group of people, the conservative Christians in England, become known as the Puritans. Uh, John Knox goes back in the 1560s to Scotland, and we start to have Scottish reforms there. In fact, really in Scotland, you have a much more aggressive reformation than takes place in England. And so from 1559 all the way through to 1688, for 150 years now after the Reformation, the Puritans seek to purify the Church of England from elements they still consider to be too much of a throwback to Roman Catholic traditionalism. And it will be a continual struggle, and we'll spend the rest of our class today talking about certain elements and developments within that 150-year period of time. Elizabeth dies uh, around 1603, 1602, 1603, and James the First, he's really James the Sixth of Scotland. He is made James the First of England because there is no longer an heir 
So Henry VIII, he tried really hard to have an heir to perpetuate his line. Uh, he ends up having three children who reign, but after his third child, Elizabeth, dies, his line comes to an end. So the Tudor line ends, and the Stuart line begins in England. So James Stuart of Scotland, who's a cousin of the Tudors in England, he becomes King James I of England in 1603. We'll talk more about his influence on the Puritans. Uh, King James is, of course, the one who commissions a, an authorized version of the Bible, a new translation of the Bible in English. It was not the first authorized version. It was actually the third authorized version. But in any case, uh, it's the most famous of all English Bible translations, the King James Version of the Bible. We'll talk more about that when we get there. His son becomes king in 1625, Charles. And uh, Charles actually is very anti-Puritan. We'll talk more about that when we get to those slides. As a result, in the 1630s, we have tens of thousands of Puritans who leave England and they travel west to New England and they establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And uh, their, their goal is to really set up a theocracy in the new world and where Puritanism will thrive and this becomes the religious foundation for the United States of America, really. And of course there are other parts to that puzzle and we'll talk about that when we get there, but why do the Puritans come? They come because of religious persecution in England. Those who stay eventually can't take it anymore and they revolt and there is an English civil war and then for a period of 10 years, well, I guess that gap in there between after the English Civil War and before the next thing on the list, uh, for 10 years we have Puritans reigning in England under Oliver Cromwell, and we'll talk about that, a period known as the period of Puritan ascendancy, or um, also known as the, the name's escaping me at the moment, um, Oh, well, the Commonwealth. There we go. Thank you. Um, and then in 1660, Charles II, uh, who was exiled after his father was killed, he comes back and he makes life very, very difficult for the Puritans again. And so then we have uh, another time where Puritans are ousted in England. They become known as nonconformists. And we'll talk about that when we get there. And then finally in 1685, James II becomes king. Shortly after his reign, we have the glorious or bloodless revolution of 1688 where William and Mary come to the throne. And then there is finally peace for the Puritans. But by that point in time, Puritanism had been dwindling for so long that it largely goes into extinction in the late, late 1600s, early 1700s. There are still some strong Christians, Isaac Watts, for example, the great hymn writer lives around that time, but Puritan ideals don't come back to the surface until the 1730s with the Great Awakening. Okay, so that's kind of a real broad overview of a 200-year period of time as we move forward from the Reformation now into the Puritan era. About 150 years, really, of English uh, church history. The Puritan era in America lasts really all the way from the founding of New England up until the, uh, well, I would say up until the War for Independence and the establishment of the United States of America. And then we start to speak of church history in terms of awakenings. We had the Great Awakening earlier in the 1740s, and then we'll have the Second Great Awakening in the early 1800s. Okay, so I'm trying to give you a little bit of a big picture. I know it's a lot of information. We're going to fill in the gaps now over the next few class periods for the next couple weeks. All right, so let's talk a little bit about these Puritans. Where did the Puritans start? Well, the Puritans really start after the English Reformation was getting underway under Edward VI, and then he died after only six years. And so we have Mary come to the throne, and her persecution is so severe that many of those English Protestants, conservative Protestants, those English Protestants flee, they go to mainland Europe, and it is there in places like Geneva and Strasbourg and other Zurich where they are influenced, Frankfurt, influenced for the gospel, uh, influenced by Reformed theology, and after Mary dies, they come back uh, 
and they are ready to see the church in England fully reformed in the same way that those cities in mainland Europe had been fully reformed. The name itself comes from the early 1560s during the beginning of Elizabeth's reign because these uh, they're Anglicans, but they are a segment within Anglicanism that wants to see the church purified. Now, there will be some of these Puritans who are so radical that they actually break with Anglicanism, and they become known as dissenters. Uh, after the English Civil War, they'll be known as nonconformists, but at this point in church history, they're known as dissenters. And even under Elizabeth's reign, there will be an act passed by Parliament called the Act Against the Puritans. But it's not against all Puritans, it's only against the dissenting Puritans, the separatists. Because there's an act of conformity that says everybody has to go to an Anglican church every week. So if you don't go to an Anglican church, if you go to a separatist dissenting church, it's actually illegal. And Elizabeth doesn't enforce it too strictly, but James I will enforce it very strictly. And as a result, we'll have those dissenters leave England. They'll go to the Netherlands for a short period of time in the early 1600s. In the Netherlands, they'll be fearful that their children are going to grow up and be Dutch rather than English. And so they'll leave the Netherlands and they'll board a ship called the Mayflower and they'll sail across. And in 1620, those dissenters will establish the Plymouth Bay Colony. Ten years later, the Massachusetts Bay Colony will be established. And I think it's about 50 years after that, that all of both Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay will join together under the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So anyway, I'm mentioning these things because I'm hoping they're starting to connect with some things you learned in your American history classes. Those of you who went to school here in the States, uh, you know about the Mayflower and you know about the Pilgrims. Of course, in public school, they never tell you why the, the Pilgrims left. Maybe they'll say it was religious persecution, but the Pilgrims came because they wanted to see the church purified in England. And they were so committed to that idea that they left Anglicanism And as a result, they were persecuted. They fled to the Netherlands and then from the Netherlands to the New World. After James dies, Charles persecutes all Puritans. And as a result, tens of thousands of them come across and establish Massachusetts Bay. Okay, so this is where church history starts to intersect with American history. And um, again, it's part of that transition as we move from Europe over to America. Uh, They were convinced that the English Reformation was still incomplete and that certain Catholic practices were still tolerated within the Anglican system. And that's why they didn't like uh, the Book of Common Prayer. By the way, the Book of Common Prayer was updated and changed from the original Book of Common Prayer that Thomas Cranmer had put together. And the Puritans came to really see the Book of Common Prayer itself as being the symbol of that traditional element that hung on in Anglicanism that they felt was a throwback to Catholicism. The Puritans were Calvinistic in their theology, and even in the late 1500s, under Elizabeth, all of Anglicanism was Calvinistic in its theology, but that would change under James and Charles. So Leland Ryken, talking about the Puritans in his book, Worldly Saints, says, No group of people has been more unjustly maligned in the 20th century than the Puritans. As a result, we approach the Puritans with an enormous baggage of culturally ingrained prejudice. Ryken continues by showing that the Puritans were not opposed to fun, fashion, sports, recreation, the arts, the physical world, or education. Puritanism was, he says, a youthful, vigorous movement, which began as a specifically church movement in response to the compromise of the Elizabethan settlement, which, as we've said, combined Reformed theology, semi-Catholic liturgy, and an Episcopalian form of church government. So even today, the word Puritan or Puritanical has a very negative reputation, at least in secular circles, Uh, Puritanism is seen as, uh, I think, being socially backward and um, 
kind of being characterized by a very strict worldview, a very strict worth ethic, uh, work ethic, and um, at least in, in broader society has a largely negative reputation. At this time, though, in church history, to be a Puritan just meant to be a conservative Christian. And so we would have all been under the banner of Puritanism in terms of our theological, um, in terms of the theological approach that uh, and convictions that we would hold. So, so these are simply individuals who were convinced of reformed truths, who were seeking to live those truths out consistently at this time in church history. Sometimes people think, well, why did the Puritans always wear black? Well, that's because that was the fashion that everybody wore at that time period in English history. So it's not a particularly Puritan fashion statement. It was simply reflective of what all of the people at that time wore. So uh, we tend to think of them in certain ways that are more reflective of just the broader culture and society in which they lived. I think in the same way that evangelical Christianity today is the conservative segment of Christianity in our American culture, that same thing would have been true of the Puritan segment of conservative Christianity in the 16th and 17th century in which they lived. All right, we fast forward then to the early 17th century because this is really where the clash between the Puritans and the Anglicans, the wedge, really starts to develop. We might say that the Puritans, when they came back to England after being exiled under Mary, that they were very optimistic about what was going to happen under Elizabeth, and they experienced a certain sense of disappointment under Elizabeth, because under Elizabeth, they thought things were going to change, and they didn't change to the extent that they had hoped, but England was still a Protestant country, and it still held to all the same Protestant beliefs at the most basic level, as all of the other countries in mainland Europe, the Protestant countries in mainland Europe. So there's a sense of disappointment, but there's still a sense of optimism under Elizabeth. When Elizabeth dies and James comes to the throne, the Puritans believe that this is the opportunity to really start to see reform take place in the Church of England in the way that they had hoped to see those reforms take place. But if they were disappointed under Elizabeth, they are going to be disillusioned under James. And under James' son, Charles, it's going to reach the point of despair. Okay, so we go from disappointment to disillusionment to despair. They think things are going to get better, but things only get continually worse. Uh, The reason that they thought that things were going to get so much better under King James was because James was already the king in Scotland. He was James the sixth of Scotland. And uh, Scotland at this time was a Presbyterian nation because it had been influenced by the reforms of John Knox. So Knox had gone and uh, really reformed the church in Scotland such that the church of Scotland was Presbyterian. And here we have James, the king of this Presbyterian country, If anyone could appreciate the need to make further reforms in the Anglican Church of England, surely it was this Presbyterian King James of Scotland. And uh, here it says James the seventh. That's actually a typo in the PowerPoint. It is James the sixth of Scotland. When James the sixth of Scotland became James the first of England, there were a thousand. And think about this, this is pretty amazing. Even if this had happened in uh, America in our own day, it would be pretty amazing. There were a thousand Anglican Puritan pastors. Remember, most of the Puritans have stayed within the Anglican system. We have a thousand conservative Anglican pastors who sign a petition asking James to please continue to make reforms in the Church of England. It's known as the Millenary Petition. Uh, It's not because they were premillennial. It has nothing to do with the millennium. It has to do with the fact that there were a thousand, uh, supposedly a thousand signers of this document. 
So as the procession is actually traveling from Edinburgh down to London, there is a coalition, I suppose, a delegation of these conservative Puritan Anglican pastors who meet the procession and present James with this document. Please make these reforms. And so they wanted to see the church reformed along Puritan lines. Adam Nicholson says this, the Puritan reformists within the Church of England saw the new reign as a chance for a new start. One of their secular leaders, Lewis Pickering, had already buttonholed the king in Edinburgh. And on James's way south, a petition had been presented to him, signed, it was said, by a thousand ministers asking for a reformation of the English church to rid it of the last vestiges of Roman Catholicism and to bring a conclusion to the long rumbling agony of the English Reformation. Now perhaps at last, with a Scottish king well versed in the ways of Presbyterianism, there was an opportunity to turn the Church of England into a bona fide Protestant organization as purified of Roman practices as those on the continent of Europe. So that was the goal, that was the desire of, and again, a thousand pastors. You know, you think of some of the documents that have been signed recently in American church history, whether good documents or bad documents, nothing has come close to having, I don't think, a thousand signatories of well-known evangelical pastors. So this is a pretty amazing statement on the part of Puritans at this time period. Unfortunately... For them, James is going to completely ignore their petition. He doesn't care about their petition, and he has no desire to change anything about the Church of England. So here we have James, who reigned from 1603 to 1625 in England. His reign in Scotland had started earlier. When King James met with Puritan leaders at the Hampton Court Conference, and that's a conference that you're going to need to remember for the next test. In 1604, so this is one year later, he largely sided against them in favor of the more moderate Anglican bishops. However, that conference saw the beginnings of the King James Version of the Bible. In fact, the Puritans, when they met with James at Hampton Court, they asked James if he would be willing to authorize a new version of the English Bible. Maybe this is a good point to just talk a little bit about the history of the English Bible up before and leading to the King James of 1611, which is when it was first published. It was authorized in 1604. Uh, if we go all the way back, of course, Wycliffe translated the Bible from the Latin Vulgate. But if we go with Tyndale in the 1620s, Tyndale published 1625, 1626, he published his English New Testament. And it wasn't long after that that a friend of his named John Rogers, even after Tyndale was killed, uh, Tyndale had been working with a guy named Miles Coverdale and then also with another friend named John Rogers. And uh, in, um, through their work, through the work of Coverdale, uh, John Rogers was able to publish the entire Bible called the Matthews Bible. In 1538, we have the first authorized Bible uh, published. Uh, it was authorized, meaning that the King of England said that you could now read the Bible. Up to this point, it had been illegal. In 1538, it's called the Great Bible. Thomas Cranmer was involved in it. It was more or less the work of William Tyndale and the work of Miles Coverdale. And uh, so it largely borrowed from their work. That's 1638. Uh, Puritans had never been fully uh, convinced that the Great Bible was the best English translation that there was. And so when they were exiled by Mary and they went to Geneva, uh, there was a group of English scholars in Geneva who worked on a new translation of the Bible called the Geneva Bible, uh, which was published in the 15, late 1550s, early 1560s is when the Geneva Bible was published. And Puritans in England preferred the Geneva Bible to the Great Bible, uh, even though it also was largely based on Tyndale's work. Pretty much all of the English translations that have ever been done have been largely based on Tyndale's work, just going back to how um, foundational his translation work was. 
1568, because the Geneva Bible was becoming so popular in England, there was a second authorized version of the Bible that was done called the Bishop's Bible. And the Bishop's Bible was worse, far worse, far inferior to the Geneva Bible. And it was even worse than the initial authorized Bible of 1568, so of 1538. So nobody in England liked the Bishop's Bible. As a result, the Geneva Bible just kept getting more and more popular. But the Geneva Bible was not authorized. So when you have a state church and you have an authorized Bible, it means everybody in the church has to use the authorized text. So the Bishop's Bible is really, really bad, but it's the text that everybody has to use from 1568 on. The Puritans don't like using it, so in their own private study, they use the Geneva Bible as much as possible. So in 1604, when the Puritans come and meet with uh, James at the Hampton Court Conference, James essentially tells them, I'm not going to do really any of the reforms you want me to do. But James says like, hey, you know what? I do like the idea of having a new translation of the Bible that's authorized for use in church. The Puritans want that because they hate the Bishop's Bible. James wants that because he doesn't like how popular the Geneva Bible is because he feels like that's really undermining royal authority. So he wants a new Bible that's going to be his stamp of royal authority on the church. And the Puritans want a new Bible because they just want the Bishop's Bible gone. So in 1604, he authorizes the King James Version of the Bible, which is then published in 1611. And the King James, 80% of it borrows from Tyndale, but the King James Version of the Bible uh, becomes then the primary Bible that is used in the Anglican Church. And it is so well done as a translation that it eventually eclipses the Geneva Bible. And you can still buy Geneva Bibles today, but they are essentially something that we think of as an artifact of history, not really a mainline translation anymore. One interesting note about the Geneva Bible is it was a study Bible. It actually included study notes that went along with the text. And that was part of the reason that James hated the Geneva Bible, because some of those study notes directly attacked the Episcopalian system in England where a king would consider himself to be the head of the church. Okay, so the English Bible has a long history even before the King James, which is ironic for the whole King James only movement because the King James version of the Bible largely borrowed 80% really from previous translations that had been done going back to Tyndale. So, so that's the history then of the authorization of the King James Bible. And you know, even in England today, it's still referred to, I believe, as the authorized text. And the copyright is still held in England by Cambridge. Though, of course, it's in the public domain everywhere else, and it is called the King James. And we just celebrated the 400th anniversary of the King James uh, last, well, I guess it was two years ago now, in 2011. Uh, National Geographic published a whole edition, a whole issue, just dedicated to the history of the King James Bible, or the King James Version is a better way to refer to that. And uh, over in the Bible room at the seminary, they have that big chart on the wall, and it comes from that um, National Geographic magazine. National Geographic printed a special poster size version of their chart just for us. It's pretty cool. Um, and uh, when Dennis Swanson, was, when Dr. Swanson was talking to the folks at National Geographic, they told him that their issue on the King James Version was the best selling issue of National Geographic in their history. So it just goes to show you that, of course, the King James Version of the Bible is still alive and well. It is still, um, along with the New King James, it represents still about 35% of the Bible market today. Uh, Best-selling book in English history by far. Uh, the New International Version has eclipsed it, though, in modern times, representing about 40% of the Bible market. Bible. Was the complaint just translation quality, or was there anything doctrinal that was being taught in that Bible? Or? Uh, I don't, to my knowledge, the Bishop's Bible did not have any sort of supplementary notes. So I believe that the primary problem with the Bishop's Bible was they felt the translation was just terrible. I think part of it was that the translation itself um, 
I'm trying to remember back, but I believe part of the problem was that they tried to maintain certain um, kind of high church and liturgical sounding language so that when it was published, it was already outdated when it was published. Whereas the King James Version of the Bible was very much a contemporary translation. But it was a contemporary translation in the early 1600s when people talked to each other using thous and these and, you know, putting ETH on the end of words. We don't talk that way anymore, of course, which is why there are new updated translations that are necessary in order to, to make the Bible understandable. The Puritans during this time continued to reject anything that seemed to them to be reminiscent of Catholicism. The Book of, the book of Common Prayer was one such object of their criticism. All right, here's a picture then of the Hampton Court Palace. This is the place where this meeting took, uh, where this meeting occurred in 1604. So some good news for the Puritans. They were going to get a new translation of the Bible for use in the church, but lots of bad news when the king made it clear that he was not interested in reforming the church in the way that they wanted him to. There's Richard Bancroft. He was the archbishop who oversaw the translation of the King James. And uh, actually, a pretty rigorous translation process. There were companies of men at Cambridge, at Oxford, and at Westminster. And as different translators completed the work, it would then go to their committee for approval and then to their entire um, company for approval. And then it would be sent to the other companies for approval. So there was a lot of checking and double checking on the translation. It's part of the reason that that translation has so withstood the test of time. Um, King James himself was, he was as, I think, as wicked and immoral as any of the kings of English history. So it's not like King James was himself a, a deeply um, pietistic man who wanted this translation of the Bible done because of his own convictions. No, uh, he himself, was uh, <laughs> actually a lot of, interesting rumors about uh, his various immoralities, which we don't need to go into in this class, but uh, the Puritans used to quip that the inerrancy of the King James Version of the Bible began after the dedication, that the dedication to King James, which makes him sound like this great, uh, very noble king, that that was really nothing but lies. And so the 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 accuracy of the King James doesn't start until after the preface or after the dedication. But in any case, the reason he did this was he really wanted to stamp out the Geneva Bible, and he knew that he wasn't going to be able to do that until he got rid of the Bishop's Bible and replaced it with something else. So as a result of this Hampton Court Conference, James makes it clear that he would support the moderate, mainstream, traditional Anglican bishops over and against the Puritan Anglicans, and we start to have persecution, especially persecution towards the separatists. So Henry Williams says, persecution now began, which except in the absence of fire and rope was as fierce and as Bloody Mary's. Spies wormed their way into conventicles and prayer meetings. Preachers without a license were thrown into prison. 300 rectors and vicars were turned out of their livings. Fines and dungeons were the fate of all who resisted the law. So if you try and, if you try and implement Puritan reforms, even in your own Anglican church, you are going to be arrested and you are going to face persecution. James dies, and his son Charles comes to the throne in 1625. And remember, if Elizabeth was a period of disappointment for the Puritans because they want to make changes and it's just not happening, and then James represents a period of disillusionment because they thought he was going to be the guy and he ends up not being the guy, Charles takes things from bad to worse. This becomes a period of despair now for the... Puritans under Charles. I, I already mentioned that under James, separatists who were persecuted left, went to the Netherlands, and came over to, uh, to Plymouth. We also have in 1609, this again is under the reign of James, uh, 
We have one of those separatists, a man named John Smythe, or John Smith, spelled with a Y, who is influenced because he goes to the Netherlands, influenced by the Anabaptists who are in the Netherlands. And we have the birth of the English Baptist movement. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we go on a little bit farther into the class. But in 1625, things are looking really, really grim for the Puritans in England because Charles I marries a Roman Catholic queen, a princess from France, Henrietta Marie, and she obviously dislikes the Puritans because she's Catholic. So once again, the Puritans now feel like they're having a flashback to Bloody Mary. We have a queen in the palace who is Catholic and who hates us. This is not good. The other part of the puzzle, I suppose the final straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, is that William Laud is made the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1633. In the late 16, oh, excuse me, in the late 1500s, early 1600s, Arminianism begins to develop and begins to become popular, not only in the Netherlands where Jacob Arminius was from, he died in 1609, but it, as his influence permeates into England, Arminianism starts to become popular within the Anglican Church. So remember, there were, there were really three things that defined Anglicanism. There was that Episcopalian form of church government. There was the high church liturgy, which the Puritans felt was way too Catholic. And then there was this Calvinistic soteriology. Well, under James, and then especially under Charles, as Arminianism infiltrates and permeates the Church of England, that third piece of what defined Anglicanism begins to disappear, and it begins to be replaced with a commitment to an Arminian soteriology. So the Puritans now have lost out the one, you know, the one leg in the stool of Anglicanism that they felt represented them has now been taken away from them. And William Laud in particular is an ardent Arminian theologian. And he wants to see Calvinism completely stamped out within the Anglican church. Well, this is going to cause the Puritans no small level of dismay and distress. So Laud persecutes Puritan pastors who deviate from the Book of Common Prayer, and he outlaws any preaching on predestination. So you tell a Calvinist that he cannot preach on the doctrine of election ever, and that is a recipe for all sorts of controversy within the church. And that is exactly what is happening at this time period in the 1630s. This, then, is why tens of thousands of Puritans leave under Charles and they flee to New England. Hutton says this, Within a week of James's death, Charles singled out William Laud for special favor by bidding him to preach at the opening of Parliament. Four days later, he drew up for Buckingham to give to the king a list of prominent ecclesiastics marked with the letters O and P. O stood for Orthodox, P stood for Puritan. So O in the sense of the mainstream traditionalist Anglican, P in the sense of the reforming Puritan Anglicans. It was clear that the new king intended to be Orthodox or mainstream traditionalist and to show no favor to the Puritan party. From the first, there was a party against him. He was already named to the king as popishly affected. That was because he married a Roman Catholic wife. Puritan fears might seem to receive some countenance when for the first time since the days of Bloody Mary, an English sovereign was united in marriage to a Romanist. So things are looking bleak for the Puritans, and they decide to leave. So here's Charles I as a boy and then later as the king. And there is his Roman Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria. There's William Laud, the archbishop who outlaws any teaching on predestination and prosecutes any Puritan who deviates from the Book of Common Prayer. Remember, that's the standardized liturgy for church every Sunday. If you feel like that's way too Catholic and you want your church to be more reformed in its church services, you're going to deviate from that liturgy. If you do that, you're going to find yourself 
in serious trouble. All right, we'll pick up with the English Civil War later, but the Great Migration, as it's called, then takes place in the 1630s because these Puritans, tens of thousands of them, say, we got to leave and get out of here. And so they go not to establish um, you know, religious tolerance in New England. They go rather to establish the Puritan church in New England. And so they do leave for reasons of religious freedom. All right, there were a couple hands. Yes? Um, is free will one of the uh, characterizing factors uh, or characteristics of the Book of Common Prayer? Is that taught in the Book of Common Prayer? No, Arminianism is not taught in the Book of Common Prayer because the Book of Common Prayer was produced while Anglicanism was still very Calvinistic. The 39 articles of Thomas Cranmer are Calvinistic. The Book of Common Prayer, his and even the later edition, uh, was still Calvinistic in its theology. The problem was that it had a lot of very traditionalistic liturgy in terms of the way we do church. And the, the um, Puritans felt that that liturgy was still too much of a reflection of Catholicism. It was still too much of a throwback to the medieval church. And so they didn't like that aspect of the Book of Common Prayer. But but the Book of Common Prayer, because it's primarily just a litur litur uh, liturgical formula for how to do church, you could make it work with an Arminian theology as well, which is what William Laud and others were, were attempting to do in the 1640s, 1630s and 40s. Yep, one more question, and then we'll be done. Is there a simple answer to why, if, if uh, election was such a pillar doctrine of, of the Reformation, you know, it, at this point it was only a hundred years prior, is there a simple answer as to why, or as to how, that could be outlawed? Well, I think a lot of it is Arminianism, which we'll talk about later. So we'll go back and get Arminius and what was happening in the Netherlands. But Arminianism is a reaction to Calvinism. And the mainline traditionalist Anglicans, they also were reacting to Puritanism. So in their reaction to the Calvinism of Puritanism, they embrace the Arminianism of Arminius and the Remonstrants and things that were happening over in the Netherlands. And uh, because they were supported by King James and King Charles, they had the wherewithal to see that change take place. And William Laud being the most, the highest ecclesiastical leader in England outside of the king himself, he had the ability to influence Parliament to pass those kinds of laws.